for the rest of our days. Yes. Amen. Amen. And if you've been like some people, you've been on your deathbed and you didn't know how many days you had left, you would praise him every day because he gave you another day. Yes. Amen. Every opportunity we have to praise his name, we should give God the ultimate praise. Just because he's been so kind, he's been so gracious, he's been so loving, he's been so forgiving. Am I the only one to know my God today that, that he gives us what we don't deserve? Amen. That's called mercy, right? He blesses us and he allows us to continue to keep on keeping on. So I'm excited to be here with you tonight, praying that your heart and your mind is open to receive what God has for us in this season. I give honor to Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. Blessings to all those who have served in his house. We've read scripture, we've prayed, we've sang. Now it's time to worship God through his word. And I've been directed as we continue on in the book of Mark to the sixth chapter of Mark. And we'll start right at the very first verse. If you don't have your Bible, the scripture that we'll be studying from will be on the screen behind me and in front of me. Mark chapter six. We'll read verse 1 through 6. And the Bible reads this way, coming from the Christian Standard Bible. He left there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. Where did this man get these things? They said, what is this wisdom that he has been given unto him? And how are these miracles performed by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joas, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his household. He was not able to do a miracle there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. He was going around the villages and teaching. Uh, for subject matter tonight, beloved, we want to use rejected. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We pray, God, that you allow us, Father God, to convey the message, oh God, that you placed upon my heart, that you allow, Lord God, clarity to come from this unclean vessel, that you allow me, Lord God, to be used, oh God, so these, your people, your precious lambs, can be fed with the bread of heaven from on high. Use me, God. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord. Rejected is what I want to chase this a lot of time that I have with you tonight. Uh, being rejected is something that many of us have experienced before. Rejection can be defined as an act of pushing someone or something away. One may experience rejection from one's family of origin, a friend, or a romantic partner. And the resulting emotions can be often painful. Rejection can be experienced on a large scale or in a small, everyday way. While rejection is typically a part of life, some types of rejection may be more difficult to cope with than others. You see, rejection stings more based on who it is that rejects you. Rejection can occur in a variety of circumstances. Typically, rejection describes an instance of a person or entity pushing something or someone away or out. A person may reject or refuse to accept a gift, for example, but I am wanting to remind you that sometimes there's a, a young man in the high school, some people who were mean, the cool kids called this guy the geek 
or the nerd, he collected baseball cards and watched Star Trek. Amen. Don't y'all laugh, because I bet that was y'all picking on him. <laughs> this young man had a crush on the, the lead cheerleader. This same lead cheerleader was a very smart, articulate young woman. They went to school together from the fifth grade all the way to 12. This young man approached her and he said, I've known you since you were young. I would love to cap off the end of our scholastic career together by you welcoming me and being my, my date to the prom. She looked at this young man and she said, the prom pictures will be posted on my grandmama's wall. My date will be in my history forever. You've got braces. You got freckles on your face. Why would I want to be captured with you for the rest of my life? Rejection. This young man had a crush on her for his whole life to have everything inside of him crushed because he finally had the courage to extend his love, to extend the opportunity to spend an amazing night with somebody that he thought the world of. But she didn't have the same type of opinion of him. The instance that we find ourselves in is that Jesus was sent to the world to give us life and life more abundantly. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible is clear that Jesus came here to save us from a sin debt that we couldn't pay. That Jesus came excitedly anticipating all those would hear his message, repent, and move according to his plan for our lives. Do I have a witness in here? But unfortunately, when Jesus came on the scene, the Bible reminds us in John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, that he was in the world and the world was created by him. And yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Rejected. That Jesus had to make certain he gave and put himself in a position that the people who would eventually reject him would still have access to the Father. How easy would it be that if, if I came to die for the whole world, but a few rejected me, if this was Ray Anthony Ruffin Jr., I'd go back and take my football back to heaven. But thanks be to God that Jesus is not a man, that he, he stuck and stayed in spite of those rejecting him. Beloved child of God, maybe that's your message today. Don't give up on the whole block of party because a few people have rejected you. Don't quit the job because you got the wrong supervisor. Rebecca, you can't say amen right there. That you must make certain that you do what you've been called to do in spite of a few. Yeah. Jesus was still taking advantage, if you've been in church for the last few weeks, to train his disciples and prepare them for the cost of being disciples. Have you been here lately? Jesus visited Nazareth as a rabbi preparing his disciples for ministry. Any good leader is not always going to show you the good parts. A good leader will expose you to the crying. The, a good leader will expose you to rejection and put your spiritual seatbelts on. A good leader will expose you to fickle people. Because if you are not exposed to fickle people, as soon as your heart is full to do something for someone and a fickle person can't keep a commitment, you're going to want to quit. So more familiar you are with fickle people will prepare your heart and your mind for ministry because fickle people can't make you quit. If you have your mind prepared to serve, people can't make you stop doing what God has called you to do. Jesus was preparing his disciples. He understood that he had recognition when he went outside of his hometown, Brother Johnny. But when he came back to his hometown, people looked at him as if he was still a little bitty boy. Now, is there anybody in here who came home? You left a little person, and you came home a little bit more grown. But when you came home, they still saw you with a pacifier in your mouth. It ain't their fault. Sometimes people can't handle your new because they, for, they for remember your old. 
So Jesus wanted his disciples to experience this firsthand because sooner or later they were going to be commissioned in the next chapter and find out what it's like to feel rejection firsthand. Because the first thing, Elder Williams, that Christians do when they get rejected is Christians shut down. As soon as we try to share the gospel with somebody and one person says no, at least I tried, Lord. You told me to tell him, and I did. He said no, so I ain't going to say nothing else. God says, I don't want you to give up with the first point of rejection. I want you to use rejection for what it's for. Use it as steam. Use it for your prayer life. Use it for your love, grace, and mercy. Because one of these days, you're going to touch somebody, and your words are going to resonate in their heart, and they're going to give their hearts to Jesus. Do I have a witness that has a prayer like that? I'm not going to stop sharing the love of Christ because one said no. That might not have been the one that I was assigned to. So I'm going to keep on speaking in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because one of these days somebody is going to come a running asking how must I be, how must I be saved? He left Nazareth to establish a base of his operation in Capernaum. Huh? There will be rejection for those who believe should receive you. Good God from Zion. Rejection don't sting the same until it's somebody that in your heart you believe should receive you. Have you ever been there that someone that should be excited for you have brushed you up as if your accomplishment is insignificant? Someone that you believe has you have seen you grow, somebody has seen your growth, they've seen your development, but for some reason they can't receive what God has done in you. Well, I'll just keep preaching to myself in here that some people cannot handle God's hand on your life. Because they remember when they used to roll up marijuana in the back of your car. And they don't understand that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Just because you remember my sin, don't mean that I still participate in that sin. That God is able to change me. So thanks be to God, he can do the same thing for you. We moving on tonight. When the, when the Sabbath came, the Bible says in, chapter, in verse 2, he began to teach in the synagogue, Jesus. And many who heard him were astonished. That's a good word. Where did this man get these things, they said? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? And how is it that these miracles are, are, are done by his hands? Our first point, he's rejected because they question his authority. Some people reject because they question your authority. In this instance, they question the authority that Jesus had to perform miracles. They question the authority that Jesus talked with. They question the authority in which Jesus had power in his hands. How is it that a common man is able to do the things that he do? The reaction of the people in the synagogue contrasts that of Jairus that we just heard about a few chapters ago that there was a man who came from the synagogue pleading that Jesus would save his dying daughter. He came from the same place. He was in a synagogue, but something was different in his heart besides these different rulers. That's something to preach right there. Just because we in the same building don't mean we see Jesus the same. J. Arius came to Jesus believing that he could heal his daughter, but some people from the same type of building question his authority. Good God from Zion, just because you sit on the road with someone don't mean the person on that road see Jesus the way you see Jesus. Keep on preaching. Mark recorded three questions from these observers. Watch it. Whenever somebody's hating on you, I want you to make sure you understand people can't hate on your life until they study your life. And if they study your life, you must be doing something well. Recognize that a thief does not break into the house of somebody who don't have anything. That if somebody want to steal your stuff, you might have something. 
So the haters were looking at Jesus with all this power and authority, and their question was not in a, a sense of, how is he doing this? Come on, let's teach. Their question was, why does he have that power and not me? How is it that you're able to do the things that you can do and we remember watching you grow up? We know your daddy and we know his occupation and we still understand, don't understand. How is it that you are able? Hmm. Three questions. He says, where did this man get these things? Can I answer them for you? God the Father. What is the wisdom that has been given to this man? A gift from God. How are these miracles performed by his hand? Because he is God. I think I'm a little too excited tonight. But if you ever question the anointing on somebody's life, the question is not why do they have it. The question is, God, when is it my turn? What have you set aside for me to do for your kingdom? God, refocus my eyes so I'm not looking at someone else's gift, but I can find out what you have for me. So I can serve the same way that Jesus is serving. Watch the language in this text. Jesus is not performing any self-serving miracles. Everything that Jesus is doing, he's bringing glory to his Father. You're preaching too hard in here tonight. If you want the anointing of another, be sure that you are lined up in agreement with God's will. Because you might be praying for something that your heart can't handle. You may want patience, but you're stingy on the inside. You might want God to do something like you do in that person, but God is waiting on you to submit to what he's already told you to do. Jesus is obviously submitted to his father. And the Bible tells us in Matthew 3 to 16, when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. The heavens opened suddenly and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son, watch the language church, with whom I am well pleased. So if God is pleased with your life and God is pleased with the direction that you're going, God will give you anointing that man can't handle. Can I fix the text? Somebody says, oh, okay, if God is pleased, that means my life is going to be easy. No, no, no. Right after this, God says, I'm well pleased. And then the text says, the spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So if God gave you something to use, torture is coming to refine you. <laughs> you can't be rejected even when you're doing it God's way. That's the devil's easiest plea. Yeah. That if man rejects you, you must be doing something wrong. Jesus is showing us that you can do what everything you're supposed to do and have the Father pleased with your life, and people can still reject what you are trying to express. The question, they questioned the source of Jesus' wisdom and the power was prompted in the power in the part of the fact that he had not studied, watch the language. Where did this power and a knowledge and authority come from? We've all studied together. But this young man has not studied with us, so we cannot give credibility to what he knows because we weren't there. Look at the richness of the text. They wasn't just hating. They was hating trying to find out how he knows so much. He ain't graduate with us. He ain't walk across the stage with us. How is it that he understands the scripture so easily and he speaks with power and authority? The good part about it is the Bible says the word became flesh. So Jesus is in the presence of people who studied the letter of the law but didn't recognize that God of the letter was standing in front of them. When can you go from Genesis to Revelations and still can't see God? Memorizing and knowing where everything is means nothing unless you know the, the God of the Bible. And the God of the Bible was in their presence and they could not recognize him. I have a question for you, beloved. As you study, can you still see God? 
Can you see God when you go out to mow your lawn? Can you see God when the birds are chirping in the, in the morning and you put the other pillow over your ear because they too loud? Can you see God when you see the sun come up every day, the moon come up every day? Can you see God? Can you recognize God? They studied the letter of the law, but they didn't know who God was because that his background didn't agree with what they thought God should be. Funny how that lines up, don't it? If your life and your background don't line up with some people, they cannot give credibility to your authority. That if you've moved in a direction or in a lane that they haven't seen or they cannot equate or understand, they try to lock you in a box. Are there anybody in here who's ever been locked in a box? That as soon as you move upward and outward, people want to keep you chained down to where you used to be. But the hand of God is on your life and people can't hold you down. It's funny how most of the haters are chickens. You understand? A chicken and an eagle are both birds and they both have wings. But the difference is when an eagle is around a bunch of chickens and they both start flapping their wings, an eagle can soar to the highest mountain. But a chicken can only come so high. So why are you basing your opinion off of chickens who can't see the view that God has given you? A chicken is only looking at the bottom of your ministry. A chicken is only seeing where you started from. God gave you something that they can't handle. He's taking you to the top of the mountain. Stop looking at the ground and the opinion of the haters. The haters see something good in you. Otherwise, they wouldn't have something to hate on. Watch. Luke 6 and 43 says it clearly for us that they hated on Jesus and they wondered about his gifts and his attributes. Luke reminds us a good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. On the other hand, a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs aren't gathered from thorn bushes or grapes picked from the bamboo bush. A good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For his mouth speaks of the overflow of, of his heart. The Bible wants us to understand clearly that these people saw Jesus in a light contrary to who he really was. <laughs> Jesus came to this world to die for the sins of us, the transgressors, and transgressors were trying to make a mockery out of the one who was going to free us. Good God from Zion, I wonder am I the only one seeing this? Have you ever been so depraved in your nature that you don't even see a good thing right in front of your face? Be sure to understand that the haters in your life have studied every advancement in your life. They know how many cars you have. They know how many children you have. And best believe they know how good your marriage is. They may never say, good job, I'm so proud of you. But they watch every move that you make. But don't be focused on haters. Keep your eyes on the assignment. Keep your eyes on what Jesus has called you to do because People are going to hate when you're down, and people are going to hate when you're up. So you too old for that, baby. You might as well keep on keeping on, because everybody got an opinion. Verse 3, as they went deeper in their questioning, isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. Next point, rejected because people were too familiar. Some people can't receive what God has placed in you because they're too common with you. That they become familiar that the spirit of God is irrecognizable because all they see is the carnality of your old man. But God has done a supernatural work in your life that super normal people can't see. 
Say it again, preacher. God has done a supernatural work in your life that super normal people cannot see. Super normal people are just extra at being normal. They won't rely on God for any help. They try to lean on their intellect and their idiosyncrasies that they want to be the smartest person in the room. But God wants you to depend on him. God wants to get the glory out of your life. God wants to see what you're going to do in the face of opposition. Will you continue to uphold God's bloodstained banner when people don't agree with what you got to say? Or will you relegate to the popular, uh, the popular opinion. He was rejected because people was too familiar. They was offended. Watch this. They was offended by his power. His power didn't match up with his humble beginning. They could see his humble beginnings and his power and it made them scratch their heads. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the one who works with his hands? Isn't this the common boy that we saw coming up as a youngster? But they could not understand how this person could have so much power that they saw in such a lowly place the last time they saw him. But now he's handling the word. Now he's doing miracles in his hand. Now he's teaching with authority. What has happened to this boy? They found it difficult to believe that he was any better than they or his family were. An indicator of a hater. A hater always tries to put you in a particular class. They either try to put you over them, which is wrong, or under them, which is both wrong. You can't be in a place where you feel under somebody else and over other people. They were trying to put Jesus in a box. I remember where you came from, but look at you now. We try to find some type of way to discredit your authority. I know ain't nobody in here ever done that before, but somebody heard about some stimulus checks coming up. Some stimulus checks coming out. And this time, about eight months ago, they was running that single mama down with all them babies. But now stimulus check time. The tables have turned. Girl, you want some crab legs? They understood the physical knowledge of Jesus, but had no understanding of the spirit man of Jesus. That they only knew what they saw, but couldn't understand what was happening inside of him. That preventing him from having spiritual knowledge of him was their lack of seeing him in God's image. Perhaps some of Mark's readers and hearers experienced this difficulty. Have you ever tried to witness to somebody in your family about the goodness of Jesus? And before you can tell him how good Jesus is, they ran you down about last time they saw you drunk. All they want to talk about is, how you going to tell me about Jesus? You still owe me $5. You talking to me about the good shepherd? You don't even pay your bills. God, I'm not here to tell you about how good I am. I'm here to tell you how horrible I am. And there is a man who loves horrible people. That's why I'm trying to introduce him to you. It's difficult at times, beloved, to share the love of Christ with people who know about your upbringing. They can't see God because they're too focused on where you came from. Okay, it's difficult to do the work of the Lord in front of those that can only see you. We have to be able to confront the people close to us and not be afraid of their rejection. Don't be afraid to, for them bringing up when you used to smoke with them. Don't be afraid when they bring up about how your first or second or third marriage fell apart. 
Don't be afraid of the people who know your resume because the Bible wants you to hold this scripture dear. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. You can't hold me back because of my past, but thank you for reminding me of where God brought me from. Turn that music on. I got a praise break. I remember when I was busted and disgusted and Jesus still died for me. I remember when my family locked the door when I came in the driveway. But now Jesus has made a brand new name for me. And now I can't go where I used to go because something in my soul just don't feel comfortable where I used to go. Do I have any witnesses in here that I used to be comfortable going to the after party and then the after party after the after party but now the new 12 a.m. is 8.30 for me watch how haters move they went deeper from saying we know that you are a common man a carpenter but they says you are the son of Mary my Bible scholars understand that. That in the biblical word, they would always refer to your father. That he is the son of Joseph. That he is the son of David. That he is the son of Abraham, Isaac. But understand the text. That they were trying to illegitimize Jesus. So by illegitimizing Jesus, they tried to take the father out of the story. When somebody is trying to assassinate your character, they swing for the juggler. So they didn't address him as Jesus the carpenter, the son of Joseph. They said, ain't that the carpenter, the son of Mary? Meaning that his, his, home, his, his home life was jacked up. That he came up wrong. He didn't have any wisdom. He didn't have any structure. So how is it that God is able to use him in this instance? And I don't want to break away, break away from the text, but I just got to have a witness party. I'll come back in a minute, God. But who can from a broken home and God has put your life back together who came from a place where daddy went to buy some cools and never come back where has God brought you from even from the broken places God can put the pieces back together now I'm back they tried to illegitimize my Jesus by saying you ain't even had no daddy even deeper, they wanted Johnny to disqualify his virgin birth. What they were insinuating is that she got pregnant by somebody and then blamed it on God. There go the, the son of Mary, the illegitimate one. But now he didn't pop back up and he got wisdom, power, and authority. How is it possible that he's able to do those things? We've seen how he came up. We've seen that she was espoused to be married to Joseph and was walking through the courtyard with a fat belly. How else could something like that happen? When people can't see the power of God, they try to put you in a sin box. When they can't understand God's hand, they try to put that on you. That you must have did something wrong. You must have done something lower than your character. That you are the son of Mary, meaning that you didn't have good upbringing. I love the fact that they called him a carpenter. Recognize that a carpenter worked with stone and metal as well as wood. In common day, we see a carpenter, and we understand a carpenter handles wood and nails. When I first heard this, and I first read it and studied through it, I wanted to my illustration, Johnny, to be about a carpenter. I said, what is the best thing you can put in a carpenter's hand? Well, you can put wood in a carpenter's hand, and you can put nails in a carpenter's hands, and he'll build you a staircase to heaven. 
but I'm glad that God showed me that the inference of a carpenter is just somebody who is good with their hands. He may be able to make a ship with his hands. He may be able to work stone with his hands. But I'm glad that Jesus chose the, the career of a carpenter because he chose a career that will make him close to people. Go ahead, God. That he didn't choose to be a tax collector because it would have put him in opposition with his ministry. Meaning that people in the household of faith, be careful of the careers you pursue because it may compromise your will. Is this thing on that we can't work everywhere and say, I'm going to go down there and just lift the name of Jesus? Well, go ahead. Jesus chose to be a carpenter because he can help people in need. Good God from Zion, that I'm going to work, but while I'm working, I'm going to help somebody on my way. I'm going to be able to serve while I'm serving. Look at God. When you are looking for your job or looking for your business, I double dog dare you to ask God, promote me to a place where I can serve. Promote me to a place where I can help somebody. Promote me to a place where I can share the gospel of of Jesus Christ. Promote me to a place. Lord, make me an entrepreneur so I can talk to any and everybody about Jesus whenever my door opens and not have to be worried about offending nobody. He, he was a, a carpenter. He was able to work with his hands and question the ability of his hands. What is it that he can do with his hands? God put him in that position for a purpose, for people to recognize the power in his hands. In his hands, he raised up Jairus, his daughter. In his hands, he spit on the ground and put it on a blind man's face. In his hands, he reached out his hands and told Timothy, look at the nail prints in my hands. The sacrifice of a savior for those who doubt me. Look at God. All those who doubt me and reject me, look Look at my hands. Look at what God has done through me for you. That in my hands, I took the beating. In my head, I took the crown of thrones. On my back, I took the lashes that you deserve, but you still reject me. You reject me. Luke 4, 22 says, they were all speaking well of him. They were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Watch this, y'all. Yet they said, isn't this Joseph's son? A tale of two crowds. Why is that initially, when he first came on the scene, people recognized him as Joseph's son? Because he wasn't a threat yet. But when he came into their synagogue and the people around the leaders saw his power, they were drawn to Jesus. There you go. You got it now, church. You ain't going to have no haters until your anointing draw people to Jesus. And if you ain't drawing nobody to Jesus, you probably ain't got no haters. <laughs> Don't be mad at me, but the more you lift him up, the devil is going to come at your door. The more you serve God, the more opposition you're going you to have. Sometimes, and this one isn't for free, sometimes we're too near to people to actually see their greatness familiar. You can really have a blessing in your house, but you see that blessing all the time, so you just disregard the blessing that's around you. You can have a blessing right in your ministry, in your church, but that blessing is so familiar and so accessible to you, you can disregard the blessing that you have in your ministry. You can have such a, a blessing in your church that you see the service and you see the sacrifice and you become so familiar, you don't recognize how blessed you are. Somebody say something to me that God wants us to recognize don't get familiar just because you're so close. Make sure you recognize when God gives you a gift, be sure you thank God for the gift and make sure you compliment that gift so you can keep moving forward. That God says, 
Don't be so familiar because you will minimize the gift that God gave you. Familiarity breeds contempt. Jesus implied that he was a prophet, which he was. The people of Nazareth could not even appreciate this aspect of Jesus' character because they regarded him as someone, watch it, just like them. He's a common man. I remember when he came up, he was just a carpenter. He used to be Joseph's son. Now he's just Mary's son, common guy. Why should we show him any respect? Why should we show any love? Should we show any attention to him? He's just the man. Bible wants us to know, Jesus said to them out of his mouth, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives and in his household. He was not able, somebody say not able, to do miracles there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Our last point is this, people are rejected because of unbelief. People are rejected because of unbelief. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 through 33, Therefore, everyone who will acknowledge me before others, I will acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. People are rejected because of unbelief. 1 John 2 and 23, no one who denies the Son has the Father. He who confesses the Son has the Father as well. People are rejected because of unbelief. Mark in his gospel stressed that Jesus performed miracles, watch it, in response to faith. Blessed. The woman with the issue of blood. Blessed. The faith of Jairus for his dead daughter. Blessed. Your faith will make you whole. Here we see the other side of the coin. Stay with me here. It's about to get deep. When you believe, you see blessings. I want to introduce you to the other side of the coin. The Nazarene's refusal to believe in Jesus resulted in him, watch it, not being able to do miracles there. So the lack of miracles in my house has nothing to do with my lifestyle, but everything to do with my belief. <laughs> Preaching here today that if you don't believe God going to do it, he not going to do it. If you don't believe God can, then God won't. <laughs> you got to pray and believe that God's going to do it. And before you pray, you got to believe that Jesus is his son. That he came in the form of a man to die for a sinner like me. And he died to give us access to the Father. And since I have access to the Father through Jesus, I can go boldly before the throne of grace and ask my Father whatever I will. If it lines up with his will, it shall be mine. Do I have any prayer words in here that you can't just pray and don't believe? If you go pray, you got to believe that God heard you. And if God heard you, he has the ability to answer you. But the Bible says he was not able to do any miracles there. Jesus had just gone from village to village performing all types of miracles. He was able to perform a miracle on the sea when the, the disciples were afraid and asked him, Carest not that we should perish? But they said to him, Do you care that we perish? My Jesus was still teaching. He said, Y'all still ain't got no faith. Wait a minute. Peace be still. 
When they got to the other side, they were still struggling because they were no longer afraid of the storm. Now they were afraid of the man who was on the boat. And when they got in front of the demon-possessed man named Legion, the disciples were still railing over what they had just saw, and they didn't say a thing in front of that demon. And the demon was removed from that man and thrown into a bunch of pigs, and yet Jesus glorified his father with yet another miracle. And when they got to the other side, he was met by Jake Arias and asked him to come and see about his dying daughter. I'm almost in my seat, y'all. And they were on his way back to Jake Arias' house because of his faith. But while he was on his way to Jake Arias' house, he had to wake up because somebody reached out to Jesus. Somebody touched Jesus and their faith pulled something from Jesus. Your faith will stop Jesus in his tracks. God says, I want you to believe me like nothing else is important. I want you to believe me because I'm right there in your storm. I'm right there when you've been tormented in your mind. I'm right there in your sickness in your body. And the Bible says that virtue came out of him and she was healed immediately. Jay Arias was looking at that and courage in his body and he can do it for her he can do it for my daughter but while they were on their way to Jay Arias' house some people from his house came and said stop bothering the good teacher your daughter has died be careful of the haters that are trying to bring a funeral to your faith he was believing God but people from his home tried to tell him that God wasn't able. Jesus walked to J. Arius' house and it was a house full of crybabies and Jesus said, what y'all crying for? The baby is just sleeping and Jesus took her by the hand because of her daddy's faith and rose her up. The faith brought Jesus in his house. Faith brought a miracle in his house but now Jesus is in the face of unbelievers and he is not able to do a miracle then. Right now. Right now. Because faith is what God is looking for yes. from all of those who claim to be believers. Unbelief limits God's working power. Acts 14, 9 and 10. Watch it. He listened as Paul spoke after looking directly at him and seeing that he had faith to be healed. Paul said in a loud voice, stand on your feet and be jump and he jumped and began to walk around. What are we trying to say here? Is that God is looking for those who believe him when you shouldn't believe anything. Do I have anybody in here that the doctor looked at you and you saw all the degrees on the wall and the doctor said it don't look good <laughs> but you says I still gotta talk to my doctor and you went and had a conversation with Jesus and now that doctor is scratching his head because he didn't believe that God was able but your faith <laughs> got you through <laughs> Your faith allowed you to pray the impossible. Your faith allowed you to believe that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, But without faith, beloved, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This implies that our decision not to believe was in spite of the evidence, adequate evidence, that leads us to the next conclusion. Watch it. These haters were morally blameworthy of their unbelief. They had the evidence right in front of them, Brother Johnny. And they made a decision to not believe. Bible says, harden not your heart. I stand at the door and I knock. He's not going to break the door down. 
Jesus is available. He's just waiting to see if you'll believe. Now, as I go to my seat, I just want to close with the story of Peter that we ended, we started off with. Peter's heart was broken from the beginning of the sermon as he asked the pretty girl to the prom and she told him, no, I don't want to be seen with you. I don't want to take pictures with you. I don't want to be remembered with you forever. He walked away sad, rejected. The 10 year reunion came around. Peter pulled up. He had a Ferrari. The young lady's Coke bottle figure looks like a two liter. <laughs> Peter got into the dance. He was still polite and he was still sweet. She walked up to Peter and she says, you know what? When I had the chance, I think I messed up. I had a chance to have a memorable night with you. And I think because I chose not to go with you, everything after that just seemed like it didn't work out for me. Peter grabbed his $9,000 suit, pulled out his handkerchief, gave it to him. He said, you keep that. <laughs> Pretty girl thought it was working in Washington. She started smirking, huh? Peter said, well, you're right. Your rejection actually ended up being like the best thing that could ever happen to me. I watched you as we grew, and I was a blessing for you. I know I was, but you couldn't see me. I carried your books. There were people who wanted to jump on you. I fought. You didn't even know. I stood in the rain with an umbrella to make certain that your walkway was dry when you came home. I did a lot of things that you didn't know about. But when you rejected me, it did something for me. It allowed me to invite someone else. When you rejected me, I looked at somebody who believed in me. And I took my dream Matter of fact, I just sold my business to Microsoft. I don't think I would have been able to conceptualize that dream until she came along. And she taught me about this man named Jesus. And after I had tried to date her for a while, she kept saying this scripture to me. And I said, I don't, I'm not churchy. She kept walking up to me saying, a man who finds a wife finds a good thing. And one day I finally asked her to marry me and I found out that I did find a good thing. That now I believe God heard my prayers. Now I can think clearly. I wasn't thinking about you no more. I could think about somebody who cared about me and she believed in me. Now pretty girl had egg on her face. And she says, now what do you mean? Are you still married? He said, well, I am. I just came to show the world you missed your chance. That Jesus came to the world and he offered life to many and many have rejected Jesus. But Jesus says, I'm going to continue to offer to those who have been marginalized. I'm going to continue to offer to those who have been set apart or set on. Those who have been departmentalized. Those who have been the underdogs. I am available for them. They've been rejected. And now I've been rejected. So we can, we can work together. Jesus came that we might have life. And life more abundantly. But be careful, church, rejecting Jesus because your unbelief will not allow Jesus to do any miracles. There. Father, we love you. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, for ministering to us today. 
I pray, God, that you continue to bless the seeds that were planted today, that you will wash them with your word. Push them far down, Lord God, that the adversary will not be able to snatch them out. Allow us, Father God, to meditate day and night on your scriptures, on your word, the word that resonated in our hearts. Allow us, God, to know you without a shadow of a doubt and believe wholeheartedly that you are the risen Savior, that you are the man, Jesus, who died for the sins of the world. Thank you, God, for dying for us. Thank you, God, for giving us an opportunity to be reunited with you through that man, Jesus. Lord, this is my prayer that somebody heard your word that wants to make a change towards you. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. And the entire church said,